This is St Andrews, the home of Birmingham City. They're the first English club to ever reach a European final, the 1960s Fairs Cup, only to go down 4-1 on aggregate to Barcelona. The club is associated with such legendary names as Trevor Francis and Gil Merrick. Trevor Francis, held by many to be Birmingham City's best player ever, made his first team debut aged just 16 in 1970. He scored all four goals in the 4-0 win over Bolton at St Andrews on the 20th of February 1971, the first ever 16-year-old to do this in league football. In 1979, he became the first ever £1 million player when he transferred to Nottingham Forest. Back in the mid-50s, one of the top goalkeepers in the UK was reckoned to be Gil Merrick. He spent his entire career with Birmingham City, making a record 551 appearances between 1939 and 1960. He won 23 caps for England and played in the 1954 World Cup. He went on to manage the club for four years, winning the League Cup in 1963, Birmingham City's first major trophy. In 2011, the club won this trophy a second time when they beat Arsenal 2-1 in a nail-biting Wembley final, the winning goal coming in the dying minutes of the match. And this is where it all began. Holy Trinity Church, as it was called then, just a mile or so from St Andrew's Stadium. It was modelled on King's College Chapel in Cambridge, and when it opened in 1823, it could seat 1,700 people. In 1871, members of the choir formed a cricket team which they called Holy Trinity Cricket Club. Four years later, in 1875, six of the choristers decided to form a football club for no other reason than to stay fit for the following cricket season. At the time, you see, cricket was the main sport in England and football was a new game of relatively little importance. These lads were a mixed bunch. The six of them were Billy Edmonds, the brothers Will, Tom and George Eden, and Fred and Tom James. Mixed in the sense that the eldest was Will Eden, 25, the youngest, Fred James, 16. But that didn't matter because football at the time was all about fun, enjoyment, it wasn't a serious sport, it was too young, it hadn't yet taken hold. And those young cricketers who'd become footballers had set the ball rolling to become Birmingham City. They called themselves in the first instance Small Heath Alliance after the area in which the church is situated. The first ever match played by the Holy Trinity Choir Boys, now playing under the name of Small Heath Alliance Football Club, was on a cold November afternoon in Arthur Street on a piece of wasteland around here. It was against a team from the Aston District called Holt Wanderers, and the result was a 1-1 draw. The scorer for Small Heath was David Keyes, who thus goes down as the first ever goal scorer in the history of Birmingham City. A year later, they were joined by Arthur James, the 19-year-old brother of Fred and Tom, and he was to become the first superstar in Birmingham City's history. He was one of these players who had everything. He had pace, incredible dribbling skills, unerring accuracy in his passing, and above all, a deadly shot. And with Arthur in the side, this team went from strength to strength. He scored the club's first ever hat-trick in 1877. And that was the year when they moved to Munt Street, which was to be their home for the next 29 years. A year later, they developed so much because of Arthur's influence that they joined the Birmingham and District Football Association. 1878 was a very pivotal year for the club but it was also a very pivotal year in the church. That year, the Vicar of Holy Trinity, the Reverend Richard Enright, became the victim of a carefully planned conspiracy. It started in Easter at the elections for church wardens. As was the usual practice, the vicar nominated his representative and the parishioners 
elected theirs, the People's Warden. But unknown to anybody, at that particular election, a number of people had infiltrated the meeting to vote for John Perkins. Why did they cheat? Why did this happen? Quite simply, because Perkins wanted to take the vicar to court because he was instituting what he believed were Catholic practices in the services of the church here. Why did he suddenly feel he wanted to do it now? Quite simply, because in 1874, Parliament passed a law called the Public Worship Regulation Act, which prohibited any form of Catholic practices in Anglican services. And a vicar could be taken to court by the church warden under those rules. What duly happened was that following the procedures, Perkins reported Enract to the Bishop of Worcester. And the bishop looked at the complaints and agreed that four of the practices perhaps were out of order. He wrote to Enract and said he had to desist. After some time and prayer and consideration, Enract agreed to do so. And as a result, the bishop said to Perkins, for the peace of the parish, stop the legal proceedings. But Perkins wouldn't. They'd started to roll. He wanted to see them through. He was determined that this man was going to prison. In 1879, Enract was summoned to appear before the court, but he refused to attend because he said, a secular court has no spiritual jurisdiction over me. I will not accept its findings. He was ruled to be in contempt of court and sentenced to prison. A year later, it took that long, the prison sentence was to be operative. 1,000 parishioners assembled outside the vicarage next door to the church to give him a rousing send-off to the station at Bordesley from where he took the train to enter Warwick Prison. It's difficult to imagine how those pioneers of Birmingham City Football Club must have felt. After all, as members of the choir, they'd taken part in these services that were deemed illegal. They also had a great love for their vicar. He was a man known to have had the esteem and affection of his parishioners. It did look at one point as if there was a chink of light because after seven weeks, he was released from jail on a technicality. But unfortunately, no good was to come of this because under the terms of the Public Worship Regulation Act, a vicar was required to resign from his parish after three years from the date that his prosecution was first announced. Shortly before this period was up, members of the parish had written to the Queen, to the Prime Minister, to the Archbishop of Canterbury saying that their beloved vicar had been the victim of a carefully planned conspiracy and it was not right that he should leave them. But it was to no avail. In March 1883, Enract had to go. A few days after he was told to leave, the Reverend Alan Watts took his first service here. Thousands turned up in support of Enract to protest against Watts's service. In fact, the police had to be called in to ensure that no harm could come to anyone. A few days later, at a packed meeting in a local school, the Holy Trinity parishioners said farewell to Richard Enract. We can be sure that those pioneers of Birmingham City Football Club would have been among them. Enract left for London. He finally went to St Swithin's in Bintree, Norfolk, which was his final parish. The Birmingham paper said at the time that he never got over those trying times, which are still referred to as the Victorian persecution. A tribute to Enract was paid in The Guardian, and it stated, the people have learnt to love and respect Mr Enract, who has laboured in his parish with unwearied kindness, and to value the many agencies for good which had grown up under his ministry. We can be sure that those words would have been endorsed by those pioneers of Birmingham City Football Club who deeply loved their vicar. We can equally be sure that his courageous moral stand 
made a lasting impact on them. The early players caught up in those events could never have dreamt that a great club like Birmingham City would emerge from the humble foundations they had laid. <laughs>